Hello, this is 637, and this is a, actually a makeup lecture, should, but it should be showing up as the Friday lecture for you. I have one um, hearty soul who's here to be my audience, so hopefully I'll, uh, that'll make it a little bit easier. And, uh, but uh, I want to pick up with the uh, discrete time Fourier transform. So uh, the discrete time Fourier transform, um, as I said last time, it's a transform from an infinite uh, uh, length uh, discrete time signal, X of n, and, but it produces a continuous uh, Fourier transform that's parameterized by omega. Here we actually represent it as e to the j omega because we can, we'll later see that uh, uh, by interpreting this as being on the unit circle, uh, we can generalize it to what we'll call a z transform. But, Omega here takes val values between minus pi and, well, it's, the function must be periodic with period 2 pi. So you only need to know this function between minus pi and pi, and you can figure out what it's equal to everywhere else through periodic extension. So now there are a few uh, functions that come up all the time in discrete time uh, signal analysis. And uh, one is the uh, step function, which is 1 for n greater than or equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. And then there's the delta function. Now, if you recall, the delta function in continuous time isn't really, wasn't really a function. I spent a lot of time explaining that it was really could be viewed as an operator. That uh, because um, um, as you take the limit of sort of a pulse as it goes to zero, the limit doesn't behave uh, well. So, but in discrete time the delta function is uh, well behaved. So uh, you have to distinguish between the two, because my notation is basically the same for the two. You have to distinguish through context. But basically, the delta function is equal to 1 at 0 and 0 everywhere else. So its sum is 1 instead of its integral being 1. The uh, pulse, uh, I, this is some notation I've made up myself because it, uh, I think it comes in handy. But a pulse of length n looks like this. So if you take... So if a pulse of length n looks like, look, if you have a continuous time si signal, this is time 0. This is minus 1. So it's, it's 0 here, and then it's so it's, uh, a pulse of length n goes from 0, and then say the n equals, say, Four in this case, because the pulse there's, there's of length four, and it's one, two, three, and then the fourth value is zero. Okay, so it goes from from uh, zero to n minus one, and uh, that's it. Okay, and then. Uh, if you take the continuous time or discrete time Fourier transform of a pulse of length n, you're going to get something similar to a sink, but a sink is not periodic with period 2 pi. So, that, so, so the Fourier transform of a pulse can't be a sink. It has to be a, something a little different, and and it turns out that this is this is what it is. So this can be viewed as a discrete time sink function because it's periodic with period 2 pi. Now, actually, this function is. Uh, is periodic with period 2 pi when n is odd, but when n is even, um, it's actually uh, periodic with period 4 pi. Uh, we'll see how that you can fix that up with a phase term. So, um, and uh, uh, then um, a periodic version of, of, of the rec function uh, uh, can be uh, written this way. So the rec function in the Fourier transform domain uh, isn't a legitimate um, discrete time Fourier transform because it's not periodic with period two, period 2 pi. So you have to extend it. So this rec function has cut off frequencies of omega 0 and minus omega 0. So it looks like this. So this is pi, and this is minus pi. This is omega zero minus omega zero, and then this is uh, two pi. This is three pi, and this would then be um, two pi minus omega zero, 
which is yeah, 2 pi minus omega 0. This is 2 pi plus omega 0. This is minus 2 pi. This is minus 3 pi. This is minus 4 pi. So this is an extension of a rec to be periodic with period 2 pi. And the height is 1. Because that, that just inherits its height from this rec function here. Okay, now, um, so here are some DTFT transform pairs. The delta function goes to 1, so the, imp so the Fourier transform of a delta is 1. A delta function has all frequencies in it with equal amplitude and zero phase. And uh, the, the discrete time Fourier transform of, of 1 um, is a, a, a pulse train. Now this thing, uh, the way that you get this relationship, uh, if you, these relationships are um, sort of extensions, limiting extensions, because the, the sum associated with 1 here is not absolutely summable, and a delta function is not a function, right? So, so the, the way you derive these relationships is you plug this expression into the inverse discrete time Fourier transform, and you'll show that it's, you can show that it's 1. It's got to be a periodic function with period 2 pi, and this is. So this is a, a pulse train. So the way to think of it is this. Um, this is uh, zero. So you have uh, an impulse. At, for the k equals zero term, you have an impulse at zero. So this is 2 pi times delta of omega. And then at 2 pi here, this is the same thing. This is 2 pi times delta of omega minus 2 pi, and then it continues on, it's periodic. So this is minus 2 pi minus 4 pi. So this function is period, this is 4 pi, it continues. This, this function is periodic with period 2 pi, and if I take its inverse the DTFT, if I use this formula here, if I use that formula, I can compute that x of n is equal to 1 over 2 pi times the integral from minus pi to pi of, um, uh, let's see, this, uh, this expression right here of 2 pi times the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of delta of omega minus 2 pi k the omega. Now what happens is that if I'm taking the integral from minus pi to pi, so this is minus pi, this is pi, there's only one of these delta functions that's in that interval. So that's equal to 1 over 2 pi times the integral from minus pi to pi of 2 pi delta of omega d omega, because it's only the k equals 0 term that's that uh, falls under that integral. So this term here is k equals 0. And then, well, this thing here then is equal to just 2 pi over 2 pi is equal to 1. So now I've, sh I've basically, I, I proved that relationship. Okay. Um, now a um, pulse of length n has a uh, uh, this p-sync function, which I defined on the previous page, that was the one I was talking about. Okay, it's p-sync um, times e to the j omega n minus 1 over 2. So if uh, n is a odd number, then uh, let's say n is 3. Well, then this would be 3 minus 1 is 2 over 2 is 1. So then this is, becomes, uh, th then e to the minus... Uh, J, um, th this re represents a delay, e to the minus J omega n minus 1 over 2. This is a delay of 
n minus 1 over 2. Now, if n is an odd number, uh, this will be an integer. But if n is an even number, then this will not be an integer. So the interpretation of this is that if you have a pulse, let's do the odd case first. Let's say uh, we'll consider n equals 5. All right, so then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right. So when you have an odd number, there's a center point. And if you had shifted that center point to zero, then you'd have this. And in this case, so this would be, um, uh, let's see. I guess the way I can write that, that would be um, pulse sub n n, uh, n minus n minus one over two, because in that case uh, n minus one over two n minus one is four over two is two, so this is zero one two, so that's n equals two is the center n equals two is the center one is equal to n minus 1 over 2. All right. so, uh, so here's the shifted pulse that's centered. So this one's symmetric about 0, so its Fourier transform will have 0 phase. So in that case, the transform of that, uh, the discrete time Fourier transform of that is going to be equal to um, P sync sub n of omega. Okay, so when n is um, an odd number, this function is periodic with period 2 pi. But when n is even, things don't work out so nicely. So usually think of odd numbers as being the unpleasant case, but here it's the even numbers of the unpleasant case. See, because in this case, the center comes out to be halfway between two points, so you can't center it. It can't be centered. So, uh, in that case, the p sync is actually not periodic with period 2 pi. And in order to make it periodic with period 2 pi, you need to add this term, which is e to the minus j omega to the 1 half. So, the product of this times the p-sync is periodic with period 2 pi because of this half sample delay. So, okay, enough on that. Um, okay, and then the sync function in time has a, uh, a discrete type Fourier transform of a p-rec. So this is important because this gives you some basic intuition as to what, uh, uh, if you have a linear time invariant filter. So if you have a linear time invariant filter, you have... Um, Let's see, uh, you have uh, x of n goes into the filter, and the impulse response of the filter is h of n, right? And that produces a y of n, okay? okay. And now, uh, if I take the Fourier transform of all these things, then x of e to the j omega is here, and then uh, this is h of e to the j omega. And then here, y of n, by the way, is then equal to x of n involved with h of n. We'll talk about that in more detail in a minute, but there's discrete time convolution. So then the output here is y of e to the j omega, and that's equal to x of e to the j omega times h of e to the j omega. Okay? All right, so uh, one of the classic situations is uh, when you have, so we'll put h of e to the j omega here, and we'll put uh, h of n here, okay? So one of the classic situations is when um, when h of e to j omega is, uh, is, uh, is a low-pass filter. So if you only plot 
h between minus pi and pi, because remember, you know it has to be periodic with period 2 pi, but you want it to be a, a low-pass filter, and its cutoff here is omega 0, and then this is minus omega 0, right? And that corresponds to the case where uh, h of e to the j omega is equal to p rect of 2 omega 0 times omega. And if, that was the case I just drew, by the way. That was this case right here, and let me just bring up my drawing. So that was this case. So I'm just drawing this much of it, but it really extends periodically. Okay, uh, Okay. so that's a classic case because that's a low-pass filter. So if you want to build a low-pass filter in discrete time, what's its impulse response look like? Well, this is, the, this is the answer right here. And, of course, you'd have to evaluate it. The way you do it is you do this integral, and you can show that this integral is equal to this. Okay, But uh, I won't do the integral, but I'll at least give you the answer that h of n is equal to omega 0 over pi of sinc of omega 0 n over pi. So, and by the way, here this is 1. That was actually the question we had before, right? So, um, so what this is saying is that if you want to build something which is a low-pass filter in frequency, its impulse response should be a sampled sink in time. And the samples, the sampling period t here is equal to omega 0 over, over pi. Remember the maximum value of omega 0 is pi, so this will always be less than 1. Okay, And remember the sinc function looks like this. If t was 1, you'd sample exactly at these, these points here, right? If you example, if you, but if t was 1, that would mean omega 0 was pi. And in that case, these would all butt together, and then this would be flat, okay? So it would be just 1. So let me do that one case real quick, because it works out really beautifully, actually. So if omega 0 equals pi then t equals 1, right? And in that case, um, in frequency, it looks like this. This is minus pi, this is pi, this is 2 pi, this is, uh, this is uh, 2 pi, this is 3 pi, right? So in that case, the frequency is the full bandwidth and then the next one is like this, and they just all butt together, and it's just 1. So in that case, h of e to the j omega equals 1, right? But the inverse Fourier transform of that is delta, right? So delta, but that works out because if you have the sinc function, The t, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, this is 4. It's not, not to scale. <laughs> this is minus 1, this is, oops, minus 2, this is minus 3, this is minus 4, right? So you're going to get one sample here, and then all the other samples will be 0. So here you'll have x, uh, oops, sorry, h of n equals delta then. It's beautiful. This is why this is why I love signal processing, because it's beautiful the way it works out. It's glorious, okay? But anyway, so but in general, usually what happens is that your frequency is below pi. So in that case you sample it and your samples say uh, fall, you know if you for if T was like one half they might they might fall like here. And then you'd have a sampled sink. 
So if you ever are designing a digital filter for a system and you need a low pass filter and you're like, oh gosh, I don't know what the impulse response to that thing should be, it's a sync function. It's just like in continuous time, only you just sample the sync. Couldn't be easier. Works out perfectly. It's one of the nice cases that comes out. Okay, now, uh, discrete time Fourier transform. Pretty much the same thing. The only thing is now you sum over two variables, one for horizontal and one for vertical. Uh, now, it kind of depends on how you want to do this, but um, um, so N is, let's see, if you have a matrix, okay, if you have an a matrix, you have F of N M, right, then then n is 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 the row, and n is the and m is the column, right? But if you have um, a function, this is the first variable is usually the x-axis, right? And the second variable is say, well, we can point it down this way, n, right? So that'd be f of m n. So you have to be a little careful. I've talked about this before because the, the order of the variables can be confusing. But you just have to keep it straight. So here n is the uh, column, uh, m, is, m is the column, and n is the row. Is that just in general too, like most of the time you talk about these? There's never any guarantees, but in this class at least I try to follow those conventions. I mean, you just always have to be careful to make sure you don't have confusion about these points. Um, okay, now, inherent, so now, just like the properties to the continuous time Fourier transform, I mean, the continuous, yeah, the continuous time Fourier transform, there's similar properties for the discrete time Fourier transform. Most of them go through, but there's a few exceptions, and the exceptions are very important. But, okay, it's linear, conjugation, Shifting, okay, shifting, this is a phase delay in, um, uh, in, um, um, a phase delay, uh, cr creates a delay in space. So hold on, I guess, where were the uh, properties for the continued discrete time for your transform? Maybe I, do I have those? Uh, hold on. I guess, no, I guess it, I don't know. I guess I don't have a table for that. Okay, so, but, you know, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, modulation. So this is, uh, if, you, if you multiply it by a complex sinusoid in time, you shift it in frequency. Um, convolution. This is very important for linear space invariant systems. So convolution with a point spread function is equivalent to multiplication in the frequency domain. And multiplication in, in space is equivalent to convolution in frequency. Um, the inner product, this is basically Parseval's theorem. It's a slightly more general version of Parseval's theorem, which is the inner product in, in, in the image domain is equivalent to the image product in the inner product in the frequency domain because, because it's an orthonormal transform. Um, okay, now... There isn't a scaling property. There's a separate, uh, uh, because if you scale a discrete time signal, the, the samples won't fall on the grid anymore. So scaling doesn't work, and rotation in discrete space doesn't work. But uh, there is a concept of a separability property, and we've talked about this before for the continuous space Fourier transform. Here, if, if, uh, if the, the, sp the function of, of, uh, uh, of uh, M and N is, can be decomposed into a product that's called separable, and in that case, the Fourier transform of um, the, the discrete space Fourier transform is the discrete time Fourier transform of each of these individual functions multiplied together, just like we did before. Now, there, you can extend this to the Z transform. Um, so the Z transform looks different, but it's actually very, very similar to the uh, d uh, discrete time Fourier transform. So basically, if uh, if you take uh, this formula here, so if you take X of Z is equal to the sum from N equals minus infinity to infinity of X of N 
times z to the minus n, right? That's the discrete, that's the uh, z transform. Now, if you evaluate um, x of z at z equals e to the j omega, well, you're going to get x of e to the j omega, right? And then that's equal to the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of x of n times e to the minus j omega n. Well, that's, this is just the, uh, this is the dtft. So, if the z transform exists on the unit circle, then the dtft exists and they're one and the same. So, uh, now, the z transform doesn't always exist on the unit circle, so this is one. So, actually, uh, uh, this is just, oh, this is 1D, uh, let, I'm doing the 1D case first. So this is uh, real and imaginary. This is the Z plane, right? It, it's not always the case that the Z transform of a function exists on the inner circle. But if it does exist on the inner circle, then, then its value on the unit circle is the DTFT. Now, um, if it exists on the unit circle, then the signal must be stable because the DTFT is um, uh, x of e to the j omega is equal to the sum from n equals oops, minus infinity to infinity of x of n times e to the minus j omega n, right? So, um, so, so this is absolutely summable Something is absolutely summable if the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of the terms, of the, of the magnitude of the terms, if this sum exists, or is, in other words, less than infinity, because it's got to be positive since it's a sum of positive terms. So if that sum is less than infinity, then the, term, then the sum is absolutely summable. If the sum is not less than infinity, then the, 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 the meaning of the sum is somewhat suspect. Because if, if, a, if a sum is not absolutely summable, then the sum's value can be set to, you can achieve any, if you have a sum which is not absolutely summable, then you can achieve any value to the sum by reordering the terms. That's pretty disturbing. Or maybe not any value. But yeah, I guess it's any value. Yes, that's correct. You can achieve any value. So you pick any real number. I can make the sum equal to that real number. I just rearrange the terms, okay? So it makes the whole concept of the sum a little bit mm, unclear, okay? So, so we'll say that the discrete time Fourier transform only really exists if this absolute summable sum, uh, if this is absolutely summable, okay? And so therefore, uh, if the Z transform exists on the unit circle, then the, um, then the, this is absolutely summable. And this signal is absolutely summable if and only if this is the impulse response of a stable system. So the, the, the impulse response is, so this, this, uh, this is a stable, this signal is stable uh, if and only if uh, the Z-transform exists on the unit circle. So the stability criteria for the signal is that the Z-transform exists on the unit circle. So uh, for causal systems, uh, well, uh, without getting into a lot of, uh, I'll just mention this real briefly. Um, if you have a causal signal, so if you have a right-handed signal, So then a right-handed signal has the property that uh, x of n equals 0 for all n less than, or than, than some n 0. So in other words, the signal um, at some point goes to 0 and stays there. Okay. Um, a causal signal that can be shown is that if you have uh, poles in the causal signal that... Uh, that uh, the region of convergence 
has to fly outside the annulus uh, that includes the poles. So these are the outermost poles, okay? The region of convergence has to be in an, uh, uh, an annulus that falls outside the region where the poles is. So if the unit circle falls inside here, so this is one, if that unit circle's there, in that case, the region of convergence for the Z transform does not include this unit circle, so this is unstable. Okay. If the alternative situation is that you have some poles, okay, and then this is the region of convergence, and then say the unit circles here, in this case, a uh, unit circle is included in the region of the convergence and the uh, system is stable. Okay, so the c criteria for stability is that the unit circle is in the region of convergence. But you may have set, heard that you say, well, a system stable is if the, pol if the poles fall inside the unit circle. Well, that's true if the system has, is, is a causal system because then it has a right-sided uh, impulse response. So for a right-sided impulse response, the region of convergence falls outside all the, the poles. So, so stable, if and only if, poles inside unit circle. But this is for, this is true for um, uh, causal systems. Of course, we usually are dealing with causal system. So for a causal system, this, the, uh, the uh, system's stable if the poles fall inside the unit circle. But for an anti-causal system, if you run a causal system backwards in time, then it's stable if and only if the poles are outside the unit circle. You know, and of course, then you can, there's the, uh, in the, in the uh, continuous time case, which we haven't covered, you hear you have the real values and you have the imaginary values here, right? And I think if the poles are, they, 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 where do they have to be? Open left, Open left half plane. That's what I thought. Okay, I, I haven't done this for a long time. So basically, there was a, a there was an, there was a story about an airplane that was took off from Wa Warsaw. Warsaw. Is that how you spell Warsaw? And 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 what happened is it was flying to uh, to uh, it was flying to uh, 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 I think it was flying to Berlin. And what happened was that uh, while um, while the plane was flying, everybody on board got on the left hand side, and the plane crashed. And the reason is because the, the poles are on the left hand side of the plane. The, it's unstable. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, okay. Okay. It's good that there's at least one person to listen to my jokes. Okay. Um, okay, now, uh, so I recovered this, basically. So, basically, if you evaluate the Z-transform, so let's assume that we're going to be dealing with stable signals. So, for stable signals, uh, the the Z transform will exist on the universe, unit circle in one or two D, and uh, then the Z, the Z transform evaluated on the unit circle is going to be the DTFT. Okay. All right. Okay. So that brings us to sampling. Okay, sampling. Um, I've already talked a little bit about sampling. We had a little prelude of sampling here because I was talking about. Uh, this situation. Uh, da, 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 da. Hold on, where is it? Oh, this was sampling really, because here I'm taking the sync function. The Fourier transform of a sync function is erect. So when I sample it, what I get is I get the Fourier transform of the sync function, in but it's now scaled appropriately in in this region from minus pi to pi. 
So this is how it's going to work. If you, a sync function is a band-limited signal. Uh, if you sample a, a band-limited signal, and, and here, okay, the, the bandwidth of, of a, uh, the bandwidth of the signal here is, uh, uh, so if it's, okay, so if a, a sync function has a band, oh, hold on, let me, let me do it this way, okay, so you have a sync function here, right? So this is the continuous time Fourier transform. You take the continuous time Fourier transform. What's the bandwidth? Uh, well, so sync has a Fourier transform of a rect, okay? And that's in F, okay? So rect goes to uh, one half. So this is one half and minus one half. So it goes from a frequency of one, minus one half to a frequency of one half, okay? Okay, so so a sync has a, a bandwidth of one half. So if you sample the sync function at uh, a rate of um, uh, yeah, so if you sample it at uh, at one, uh, something's wrong here. I shouldn't. Uh, hold on, just a minute. So, omega over pi is, um, uh, if you sample at a period of 1, you get a delta function, and that's a frequency of 1, so that can't possibly be right. I got this messed up. Uh, this is correct. What did I do wrong? Huh. Well, I'm getting myself... Did I do that? Uh, let me see. This is sync of t. This is t. And the Fourier transform of sync is rect, right? And I, I got that right. So this is uh, s of t. And then the Fourier transform of that, which is, so it would be like x of t. And then x of f is equal to rect of f, right? So that's right. So if I sample at uh, frequency one, if I sample at frequency one half, I will get that's uh, if the frequency is double. Oh right, yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, so f sub s. So t here, so if t is equal to 1, I would get the samples right at these points, right? That's the minimum sampling frequency I can have. So t sub s is a sampling frequency. So the sampling frequency f sub s is equal to 1 over t sub s is also equal to 1, okay? So this thing, the bandwidth f sub c is equal to 1 half. So that's the cutoff frequency of the signal. So I have to sample f sub s needs to be greater than or equal to 2 f sub c. I have to sample at least twice, as, uh, twice the frequency of the signal. So that's 1. And sure enough, here f sub s is 1, and uh, f sub c is 1 half. So 1 is greater than or equal to 2 times 1 half equals 1. So that works. So that's the minimum sampling frequency. But if you sample only at these positions, then uh, then you basically um, the signal is just right at these edges. So it's, you're just on the hairy edge of disaster. What you really want to do is sample at higher frequency. If you if you want to plot a sync in MATLAB, you wouldn't sample at the frequency one. You'd probably sample at the frequency I don't know. You, you'd sample at the frequency 100. So you'd take 100 samples in between here and here. So you'd get a nice smooth curve. In that case, this frequency, in the frequency domain, uh, if you sampled at 100, what would happen? Let me just draw that case. So that's sort of an extreme case, which people, is, it's very intuitive for people. 
So if you go to plot the sinc function in MATLAB, you're going to maybe take t sub s to be 1 over, I don't know, uh, 20. So you get 20 samples here. So you're going to get a whole bunch of little samples. And when, you, when those samples are really close together, it's going to be really easy to see what the shape of the function is. You won't get a lot of bumps in the plot, right? It'll be a nice smooth plot. Well, what will happen then in the frequency domain is that from minus pi to pi, if you look at the, the frequency content of the sampled signal, now, if you were sampling at 1, it would have come right up to these edges. But instead, you're sampling at 20, so it's going to be pi over 20 here. So the signal will be right at the very low frequencies. So you'll have a nice big wide band here that's open. Now if you go out here, it'll be periodic again. Right? But, and dot, dot, dot. But this guy's far away, so you don't see it. So, so that's the intuition. When you sample at a high frequency, what happens is that the, 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 the signal, if you sample at much higher than Nyquist, then the signal is well contained within the range from minus pi to pi. If you sample below Nyquist, the signal will bleed over outside of the range from minus pi to pi, and then you'll have aliasing problems. So, but the criteria is that the sampling frequency has to be greater than or equal to two times the cutoff frequency or you have aliasing. This is the Nyquist criteria. All right? See, so if you have a voice signal, and the voice signal has is three kilohertz, what's the minimum frequency you have to sample at it in order not to get aliasing? Well, so this is FC is three kilohertz. You got to sample FS uh, is equal to uh, greater than or equal to six kilohertz. For instance, audio CDs, audio CDs. Are, are designed to be able to take, uh, uh, maintain fidelity in signals all the way up to 20 kilohertz, right? From zero to 20 kilohertz. So the sampling frequency needs to be greater than or equal to 40 kilohertz. In fact, I forget what, exactly what it is, but it's something like 42 or 43 kilohertz or something. So there's some additional margin here that they throw in, to, otherwise uh, it becomes difficult to do it precisely. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Okay, now, oh, going back to my regular slides. Um, okay, when you sample a signal in time, so these are the mathematics, but I wanted to give you the intuition first. If you sample at frequency, so your sample frequency fs is 1 over t sub, well, I could put an s here just to emphasize, 1 over t. That's your sample period. And then, um, if you sample the signal, so um, uh, G, uh, G of T is a continuous time signal, so its continuous time Fourier transform is G of F. Then the discrete time Fourier transform of the, so sampling in time is straightforward. The mathematics of that is simple, that uh, S of N is just equal to G of NT. Couldn't be easier, right? And you have uh, a continuous time signal, it varies, say, like this, and 0, this is t, this is 2t, this is 3t, and each of those points you take a sample. So the discrete time signal is just the continuous time signal evaluated at times n times t, okay? Right, so that's easy. So you'd say, well, okay, if that's so easy, why can't we just leave it there? I mean, why aren't we just done? Because this isn't giving you a lot of insight into what the relationship is between the information in S of N, the discrete time signal, and G of T. I know I can get from G of T to S of N, but the question is, can I get from S of N back to G of T again? Can I reconstruct the signal from the samples I've taken? In order to get insight into that, we need to look at the frequency domain. And this is the equation that relates the continuous time Fourier transform of G and the continuous and the discrete time Fourier transform of S. It's related through this expression here. Okay, now, 
what's the key issue? Okay, so you can study that equation. Okay, but what's really happening is this. This is a mapping from the uh, from the continuous time frequency to the discrete time frequency. At first, ignore this this sum and only consider the case where the k is equal to zero, the first term. So this is just a scaling in frequency domain. So what happens is zero frequency in discrete time, omega is for discrete time frequency, and f is for continuous time frequency. f goes from minus, uh, goes well, it, it's in units of hertz, okay? And omega here goes from minus pi to pi. Zero in continuous time is zero in, in discrete time. That's clear. But the interesting thing is one half the sampling frequency corresponds to pi, and the sampling frequency corresponds to two pi. Then there's a scaling factor associated with one over t, but that's not so critically important. Excuse me. Yeah, it's it's that's to maintain energy exactly. And then um, so it looks like this. Okay, so this is the Fourier transform, continuous time Fourier transform of the, of the continuous time signal. It goes from, uh, so, and this is half the sampling frequency to half the sampling frequency, and hopefully the signal is band limited to that range. So the cutoff frequency of the, of the signal is that point where the triangle touches the axis, but the sampling frequency, half the sampling frequency extends beyond there. So you want, the sampling frequency to be more than twice the cutoff. When, then if you apply this formula here, right there, you just apply that formula, uh, this is what happens, that you replicate these triangles, and as long as they don't uh, fold beyond, as long as you don't violate the Nyquist criteria, then there's no overlap between them here. And there's also a shift in the amplitude from one to one over t. But zero goes to zero, and one half the sampling frequency goes to pi, and the sampling pre frequency goes to two pi. That's what you want to keep in mind. Then the 2D case is, is pretty similar. Um, now it becomes a, um, it's a, um, um, a, func a continuous function of space. So x and y are the continuous space variables. It's sampled, and the sample spacing could be different along the x and the y dimension. So you get a discrete time signal. And um, uh, then the discrete time Fourier transform is the, uh, is this, uh, 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 the discrete time Fourier transform of the sampled signal is related to the continuous time, continuous space Fourier transform of the continuous signal through this relationship. It's the same thing, only have a double sum because you replicate along the horizontal frequency and vertical frequency axes. So zero, zero goes to zero, zero, and this is one over two x, tx is one half the sampling frequency in the x direction. That goes to pi. One half the sampling frequency in the y direction goes to pi. And the combination goes to pi pi. Oh, that's there, pi pi, okay? So it looks like this. You have a signal. This is half the sampling frequency in the horizontal axis. This is half the sampling frequency in the vertical axis. If the signal's band limited to that range, so it needs to be band limited to a, a, uh, to a rectangle like this, right? If it's band limited, then the rectangle just gets re replicated. And the boundaries of the, uh, of the rectangle go to pi. And they don't overlap. As long as they don't overlap, you haven't lost any information and you can reconstruct the signal. This is called Nyquist sampling in 2D. So the question, now if, if the signal, now in practice, signals are never perfectly band limited. So there's always going to be a little bit of aliasing. So some of the signal is going to bleed outside of the of half the sampling frequency, and you're going to get a little bit of overlap. These regions of overlap, uh, there's going to be corruption in the signal that can't be recovered exactly. Because uh, if you filtered it out, the, some of the frequencies are bleeded into the, into the wrong range. And by the way, that's where the name aliasing comes from. Uh, um, we're almost finished here, but this is pi. That when 
uh, when the, the frequency bleeds over here, this was correspond to that frequency, but now it's behaving like that frequency, so it's acting like an outlaw in the West, and it has an alias, okay? All right, well, that was good. We'll finish up with sampling at the uh, next lecture, which will be on Monday, and have a nice weekend. Bye.